And then let's open our Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Let those guys see you as you make your way back if you want a Bible. Great questions this morning by the kids. Did the world know? Well, a corner of a dark part of the world knew when angels were told. And that's what we're going to look at this morning in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 20. You know, there are some very usual features in an American-styled Christmas that you've all seen over the last many, many weeks. And the usual features in an American-styled Christmas can warm just about anybody's heart. Uh, It doesn't matter if you're a skeptic, an atheist, a secularist, a materialist, or even a Christian. You can find your heart filling up with enjoyment in chestnuts roasting on an open fire. I don't even know what a chestnut is. But it sounds really pleasant as I hear the song. And it warms the heart, right? Sleigh rides, which we know nothing about here. Christmas trees. Holly and mistletoe, giving gifts to one another. Americans of of every stripe and with every belief system find in a common way these images actually enjoyable and they bring them into the center of their celebration at this time of year. We might call these usual features something like maybe common graces or creature comforts. Their their kindnesses from the God who made us all, kindnesses given to all of his creatures, to those who love him and to those who hate him. Matthew 5.45 says that his son rises on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous, and he lets people of all kinds just enjoy simple pleasures in life, creature comforts, pleasant songs to sing and listen to while we wrap gifts for one another. The unbeliever and the believer alike in the same neighborhood feel a warmth rising in their hearts over these kinds of common graces or creature comforts. And my question is for you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, is that celebration as believers, that kind, all that we should aim for? Should we as believers be content if all that we enjoy and celebrate this Christmas is the same thing that your unbelieving neighbor enjoys and celebrates? Or should our celebration at Christmas be distinguished from theirs in some way? Should it reach a different level or enjoyment or celebration? And the answer, of course, is yes, it has to. If our celebration at Christmas reaches only the same level of celebration an unbeliever has because of the kindnesses that God gives to all of his creatures, we as believers actually fall woefully short in our celebration. So how do we rise above that celebration that is actually centered on creature comforts? How do we rise above that? How can your celebration at Christmas reach a level that the secularist, atheist, materialist, skeptic can't? Well, you know, it's by turning to God's word and seeing the biblical account of Jesus Christ. We don't get there to a better celebration by fusing into all of those creature comforts some kind of a spiritual meaning, you know, like snow takes on a spiritual meaning and Christmas trees take on a spiritual meaning. That's not the way we do it. We turn to our Bibles and we look for the birth of Jesus and we look for the details and the features in his birth. So we raise our celebration at Christmas by looking directly upon Jesus and the distinguishing features of the biblical account of his birth. So like an American-styled Christmas has its own features, so the biblical account of the birth of our Savior has its own distinguishing features, and they are inseparably tied to the baby, to Jesus, which is exactly why the secularist, materialist, atheist, skeptic can't raise his celebration any higher because it can't be tied to Jesus for him. But the believer in Jesus Christ must latch on to these distinguishing features that raise our celebration to the height 
it must reach. And so how do you know? Here's the question. How do you know when your Christmas celebration is all that it should be? Number one, when it embraces the scandal of Christmas. Look at verses one to five. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. The birth of Jesus was filled with what looked like scandal. The obvious evidence is in verse 5, a pregnant, engaged, sort of married teenager. Mary was with child, engaged to Joseph, and that appeared to be scandalous at that point in their relationship. But Mary was not pregnant by Joseph, which made it even appear more scandalous. And everyone looking in on that young couple in that first century would have concluded with disgust that God was nowhere near to be found with this couple. But we know what the truth is from the biblical account. The only way this apparently scandalous thing has happened is because God is precisely near to this couple. He's at the center of what is going on. A virgin is with child because of the Holy Spirit. So if you're going to celebrate the right Christmas, you'll need to come face to face first with this holy scandal. And you'll need to wrap your mind and your heart around it. And then your celebration will be distinguished from the rest. So how do you know when your Christmas celebration is all that it should be? Well, when it embraces the scandal of the birth of Jesus. How do you know, secondly, when your Christmas celebration is all that it should be? Number two, when it embraces the humility of Christmas. Verses six and seven. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in claws and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. We really have no idea what the environment was specifically. I read even this week that some think it might have been some kind of a small room inside of a building or a cave or a shelter. What we do know is that a feeding box for animals was there, a manger. And the promised, exalted son of David was not born in a palace. The son of God was born in a cattle's trough. That is a lowly, humble place for any child to be born. Can you imagine laying your baby there? Yet the Son of God willingly stooped down to such a place like that in his birth. And whenever we focus on this passage, I love to give you this quote from Kent Hughes. Look at this. This captures the humility of Jesus better than anything. If we imagine that Jesus was born in a freshly swept county fair stable, we missed the whole point. It was wretched, scandalous. There was sweat and pain and blood and cries as Mary reached up to the heavens for help. The earth was cold and hard. The smell of birth mixed with the stench of manure and acrid straw made a contemptible bouquet. Trembling carpenter's hands, clumsy with fear, grasped God's son, slippery with blood. The baby's limbs waving helpless as if falling through space, his face grimacing as he gasped in the cold and his cry pierced the night. It was clearly a leap down, as if the Son of God rose from his splendor on high, stood poised at the rim of the universe, irradiating his glorious light and dove headlong, speeding through the stars to earth where he plunged into a huddle of animals. Nothing could be lower except for the cross that he died on. This certainly is a mark of humility. The, to be the infant, naked, son of God, cradled in a teenager's nervous love, 
but it is an incomprehensible mark of humility to be the grown naked son of God crucified by a heavenly father's infinite love for sinners. What humility is this? The son of God that he displayed this kind of humility from a cattle's trough all the way to a criminal's cross. So how do you know when your Christmas celebration is all that it should be? When it embraces the humility of the birth of Jesus. Humility like this, centered on Jesus Christ, is just not at the center of an American-styled Christmas. But a Christmas celebration that embraces Jesus Christ's humility from his birth all the way to his death for sinners, that will distinguish your celebration apart from the rest. Thirdly, how do you know when your Christmas celebration is all that it should be? When it embraces, number three, the grace of Christmas. Look at verses 8 to 14 with me. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth Peace among men with whom he is pleased. Grace. Grace is that favor from God that is received, that is not earned, it's not merited, it's not deserved, it's undeserved favor that is received. And you say, well, where is that in this account? Well, the Jews in this day had a list of thieving occupations. People who were known for being notorious robbers and shepherds were at the top of that list. They were as well-liked in Jewish culture at this time as the turncoat tax collectors were. The religious leadership of Israel, they denied shepherds civil rights and due process. Shepherds could never be a witness in the courts of law because obviously they were liars and they could not be trusted. They were deceivers. They couldn't be trusted to give credible testimony. Every man in Israel in the first century would recognize shepherds as men who did not deserve anything good. No man in Israel would have extended favor to them because of how unworthy they were. But God, in the birth of his son, he did exactly that to these men. He was gracious. He showed them favor even though they were unworthy. He showed them favor when they, that, that they could not earn, that they couldn't merit, that they couldn't deserve. When the angel came to them and gave them good news of a savior for the likes of these rascals. When it came time to announce the birth of his one-of-a-kind son, note what God did. He completely bypassed all of the religious leadership of Jerusalem and of Israel who thought they were worthy people. And instead, God sent from heaven the host of heaven into the fields of undeserving, unworthy shepherds to alert them of the birth of his Savior Son. That was completely unworthy to unite holy angels with unworthy shepherds in a field, telling them there's a savior. That's the mark of the grace of God towards undeserving sinners. But that unworthy union out there in the fields that night between shepherds and uh, and holy angels at the birth of God's son, that's nothing compared to the union between unworthy sinners like us with the holy son of God. Unworthy sinners like you and me, forever united to a holy God through his crucified son when we believe him. And by grace alone, through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, we enter into an inseparable oneness that the shepherds and the angels never had together. But we have it with the son of God through faith in him. We did not earn it. We cannot earn it. We cannot merit or ever deserve such a salvation union like that with God. 
the unworthy shepherds did not deserve a meeting with holy angels, how much more so do we not deserve union with Christ, the holy son of God? The marks of that other Christmas, the American-styled Christmas, will never lead you to think on your own unworthiness before God. But when you read this account and you see the shepherds, let their unworthiness remind you of your own unworthiness as a sinner before a holy God. And let the grace of this Christmas in your Bible overwhelm your heart and overwhelm your mind and lead you to grateful celebration of a kind and merciful Savior who is Jesus Christ. That will lift your celebration above the world's. Is your celebration of this Christmas all that it should be? How do you know when your Christmas celebration is all that it should be? Well, it embraces the grace of Christmas. Fourthly, how do you know when your Christmas celebration is all that it should be? When it embraces the joy of Christmas. Verse 10, look at it with me. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. I bring you good news of great joy. Heaven came crashing down on these reject shepherds with a message of great joy. The angels do not ask the shepherds to produce their own version of shepherd happiness, you know, whatever it is that makes shepherds happy. Think on that. No, heaven brought its own joy to them in the message of the birth of a savior. So get this, heaven's joy for you, for shepherds, for us, for unworthy sinners, if you'll receive it, is this, that God will save sinners through his son, by grace, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's the joy of heaven given to us. Heaven's joy for you is this, if you'll receive it. The baby in the manger dies in the place of the ones who trust in him alone. That's heaven's idea of joy for you. Heaven's joy for you is this, if you'll receive it. Sinners are rescued by this one-of-a-kind son. God was pleased in the birth of his son to provide for you what you cannot provide for yourself. You cannot provide for yourself escape from God's wrath. You cannot uh, supply for yourself a righteousness that he looks upon and that he enjoys and draws favor and kindness and goodness over. And you cannot even provide your own faith and repentance. He provides it for you. Listen, our American-styled Christmas version out there, it wants you to believe it's the hap happiest season of all. But it only ties its happiness into those creature comforts. That's the best it can do. It won't tie its creature comforts and its version of happiness into our need for a savior to save us from God's wrath that we deserve. So what kind of happiness is there for us if we're never brought to see our need for a savior? But if you will labor instead to see the joy in the birth of the savior Jesus, you'll be led to heaven's joy for you, not the world's happiness. If your celebration at Christmas is influenced by heaven's joy for you in your need of a savior, and then your Christmas celebration begins to rise above the rest. Fifthly, how do you know when your Christmas celebration is all that it should be? When it embraces, number five, the curiosity of Christmas. The curiosity of Christmas. Verse 15, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and they found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. Do you see the curiosity of the shepherds for the good news of a savior? Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing. They came in a hurry. They were told what God had done, but they had to see more for themselves. They had to see it with their own eyes. Think about how much more curiosity for our need for a Savior can be satisfied, though, compared to the shepherds that night. 
They had their curiosity about a savior, the need for a savior satisfied when they saw him lying in the manger. But we can have that and much, much more because our curiosity for our need of a savior, it starts there in a manger, but it goes through the rest of the New Testament and we can see him not just lying in a manger, but we can see him hanging on a cross. And that tells us so much more about our need for a savior. You can see an empty tomb. The shepherds weren't content to merely hear about these things out in the field. It had to become a personal pursuit of the Savior for them. What about you? What about you? If your Christmas celebration isn't marked by a curiosity to go to God's word and rediscover the mystery and the need of the incarnation that races all the way to his crucifixion, your celebration this Christmas won't be all that it should be and must be. How do you know when it is what it should be? It embraces the curiosity of your need for a savior. Sixthly, how do you know when your Christmas celebration is all that it should be? Number six, when it embraces your heart at Christmas. And there's only 14 more. Don't worry, we're getting close. I'm kidding, there's only two left. It has to embrace your heart at Christmas. Look at Mary in verse 19. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. Mary was impacted by what happened. She was impacted in her inner person. That's what the heart is in the Bible. It's not a piece of who you are. It's who you are inwardly before God. Who she was inwardly before God was impacted by the things that the shepherds related to her. She treasured them. That means she guarded them. She preserved them. She kept them in a safe condition. She kept those truths in a safe condition so that she could come back to them and draw on them again and again and again. She was pondering these things in her heart. That means she didn't casually think of them here and there, but that instead she thought seriously about all of this at the inner person level. And again, I mean, we sit here in a place of much greater privilege because of how much more there is for us to ponder than what there was for her to ponder that night. If your celebration of Christmas doesn't take time to pause, to engage your heart, with the staggering implications of the birth of Jesus, of the life of Jesus, of the death of Jesus for sinners, of his resurrection from the dead, then your celebration will fall woefully short of what it must be. Listen, we don't merely need our emotions stirred by common graces, by creature comforts. We must have all that we are inwardly before God at the heart level engaged in pondering what is it that God has done for sinners? What is he doing for our salvation in the birth of his son? So how do you know when your Christmas celebration is all that it should be? When it impacts your heart with the truth concerning Jesus Christ. And lastly, how do you know when your Christmas celebration is all that it should be? Number seven, when it embraces the worship of God at Christmas. Verse 20, the shepherds went back, back to the fields, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. We finish by having our attention turned back to the shepherds. Notice that learning about the birth of of the Savior, learning about their need for a Savior, going and seeing him, it all ended in worship of God. It ended in worship of God. That's where their thoughts ultimately terminated when they learned all that they learned and saw all that they saw in the birth of Jesus. And that's how you know if your celebration this Christmas has reached the heights that it should reach, it's when all of your thoughts terminate in worshiping God. And that, of course, is what distinguishes the believer in Jesus Christ celebration from an American-styled celebration because our celebration equals worship of God. 
And that's something that an American-styled Christmas is just not designed to provoke in a heart. Our celebration must actually be worship of the God who sent his son to be our savior. That's what sets our celebration apart. That's what makes you different than your neighbor who's got everything out in his front yard that you have and more. They are enjoying good things, no doubt, without exalting God. Their feelings are warmed but God is not worshiped. They are celebrating, but not worshiping. And the believer in Jesus Christ can and must do better. Is your celebration worship? Worship of God? It can be if you will entrust your life to Jesus Christ. The one who was born to die. Born to die for sinners like you and for me. Don't merely terminate all of your happiness on creature comforts. If that's what you're primarily excited about, that says a lot about where you are. And you need to be in another place. You need to be one who is stunned by what God has done in his son for sinners in sending his son to be born, to become so vulnerable, to live a life of, of purity and goodness before the people that he ministered to, meant to die an excruciating death, experiencing the wrath of God somehow in time on the cross, an eternity of wrath for those who would believe him. That must mesmerize you, capture your attention, lift up your heart and your mind to worship. Do you believe Jesus Christ? Will you, even today? Let's pray. Father in heaven, that you would be willing to part with your son, that he would take on human flesh in Mary's womb, that he would get true humanity from Mary and be truly God at the same time. What a mystery but it had to be. It had to be that way for us. You are the God who already was glorious. You did not add anything to your glory. You didn't add anything to your character in being this way and doing this for us. This was for us that we might be saved, that we might have our eyes open to see our need for a Savior, that we might have our mouths opened upon believing your Son, that our mouths would be open to worship you, to declare your goodness, to declare your mercy, to declare your glory. Father, I pray that you would work in the lives of those here, even this morning, who maybe haven't thought about their need for a Savior, and I pray, God, that you would impress upon them the truths from the gospel of Jesus, that they are in need of a Savior and that you have provided him. His name is Jesus. Father, give them the faith to trust him that they cannot gin up on their own. And Father, lift up our hearts as believers that we would not merely celebrate, but we would worship you this Christmas. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.